Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to our new moon service. And uh, we're here obviously on the uh, first day of the 11th month. And based on our reckoning of the calendar, we're in the 41st year of the 40th Jubilee. Welcome, as I said, to our service. I'd like to start services by asking James if he would please open in prayer. If you all stand for the opening prayer, we'll turn the mic over to James. Yes, thank you very much. Our Father, Yehovah, Yehovah of all of the hosts of creation, of all that you made for the benefit of those that are given life on your creation. We regret that we participated in not properly taking care of this planet. I would allow it to be degraded and actually come under assault by those that wish to destroy this work of your hands. So we'd ask for your assistance and give us good discernment so we can know what foods are safe to eat, what's safe to drink as much as possible that we can use our own ability to discern. We'd require you to give us, enhance this discerning ability so we can make correct decisions in keeping ourselves alive in the future and protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and all of your called Israel throughout the world. So we know we've been deceived, everyone has, by this great deceiver, great liar and, and deceiver. We're involved ourselves in this war. See, uh, all of war is based on deceit. So we ask uh, you please to help us use our your spirit effectively and in this matter so that we can make proper decisions. So we have no fear at all in this battle and we'll make our very best efforts to not be confused by this changing of frequencies in our media from 444 hertz down to 440. It has an effect on our thinking, on our DNA, and our ability to make this discerning measures, really enhancing the captivating of our minds and brainwashing us really without our knowledge. So we'd ask you please to help us keep our thoughts properly detected, directed to your way, to your ways of thinking, strengthen us that we can preach the good news of the gospel to all the world as a message for all mankind and Please help this, this mankind from being, having their DNA corrupted with other kinds that are in creation. For that appears to be the goal of what's being done. That the mankind is be eradicated, being mixed with other animals on this planet. It's difficult for us to know how to protect ourselves this. So if you please give us uh, some knowledge of how to do that, we would ask for this, please. So we give you thanks for life. We ask you please to strengthen us. We give you the glory of your creation. And we're all repent and are sorry for the parts that we've played in not following your way as we should have from the beginning. So we give thanks to all of this, and we ask for this, please, by the authority of your Son, Jesus, your Christ. Amen. Amen to that. Thank you, James. Yeah, this planet is under uh, quite the attack. 
Um, I've been noticing in the last few days that there's been a lot of uh, earthquakes in the in the ring of fire um, that have been over 6.0. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's a harbinger of the end times, you know, coming on us or being on us, but uh, I just thought it was interesting. So if you'll please take up your hymnals and open them to page 52. We'll sing our opening hymn, which comes from Psalm 71, titled, For Even From My Youth, O Yah. And that's on 52. For Even From My Youth, O Yah. Okay, it's a beautiful hymn to start our song service off. You'll now turn over a few pages to page 57. We'll sing our second hymn titled, Let Us Sing to Yah, and that comes from Psalm 75, after which we'll turn the mic over to Wes to read in the book of Genesis, chapters 37 through 39. So page 57, let us sing to Yah.
Okay, if you'll all be seated. I like the, the lyrics in that, that hymn. It is Yah who lifts up men. It's not going to come from the east or the west. Our only hope is in our God. So now we'll turn the mic over to Wes to read in the book of Genesis chapters 37 through 39. Wes, over to you. Well, I didn't give a sound check, so I hope everything's okay, Dave. Yep, coming through loud and clear. Okay. Chapter 37, Joseph's dream. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is according of, according of J, Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah, and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made him a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, and when suddenly my sheaves rose and stood upright. And while your she is gathered around mine and bowed down to it, his brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he said, told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the thing in mind. Joseph sold by his brothers on chapter the verse 12. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all's well and your brothers with the flocks, and bring word back to me. So he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. And when Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the field and asked him, where are, you, where, where are you looking for? And he replied, I'm looking for my brother. Can you tell me where they are, grazing their flocks? They have moved on here, the man answered. I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in a distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a fierce animal devoured him. Then we will see what comes of his dream. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. 
Reuben said, this is to rescue him from them and take him back to their, his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Then camels were loaded with spices and bombs and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped a robe in the blood. They took the or ornamented robe back to their father and said, we found this Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Judah and Tamar, chapter 38. At, at that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adulma named Hiram. There, Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man named Sheol. He married her and laid with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Ur. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him, I said Onan. She gave birth to another son and named him, I don't care, here it is, him, him Shelah. He was a Kizid key, that she gave birth to, to him. Judah got a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, lie with your brother's wife. Fulfill your duties to her as a brother-in-law to produce offsprings for your brother but Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he laid with her, her, his brother, his wife, he spilled his seed on the ground to keep from producing offsprings from his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So he was put him to death also. Judah then said to his brother-in-law, Temaz, live as a widow in your, turn in the page, 
father's house until my son Sheol grows up, for he thought he might die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house a long time. Judah, wife, the daughter of Sheol died. When Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah to, to the man who were shearing his sheep and his friend Hara the Alu Dulamite went with him. Then Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to uh, shear his sheep. She took off her widow clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance to in, in aim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that though Sheol had not grown up, had now grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me She's to sleep with you, she asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock. He said, will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? She asked. He said, what pledge shall I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with, it, with her, and she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Ju Judah sent the young goat by the friend, the Abdomite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. He asked the man who were there, where is the sh uh, sh shrine prostitute who was beside the road at Elim? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her beside the bed. Men who lived there said, there hasn't been any shrine prostitute here. Then Judah answered, let her keep what she has, or we will become a laughingstock. After all, I did, not, I did send her this young goat, but you, you didn't find her. After three months, Judith was told, your daughter-in-law, Tamar, is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and ha have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a messenger to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son, Gil. And he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there was twins in her womb. As she was given birth, one of them put out his hand. So the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it to his wrist and said, this one came out first. But when he drew his hand back in, his brother came out and she said, so this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez for he, for, for and then his brother who was, the scarlet thread of his wrist came out, and he was given the name Zorah. Verse chapter 39. Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Now Joseph had been taken down into Egypt with Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of the Pharaoh's officers, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelite who had taken him there. 
The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owed from the time he put him in charge of his house and of all that he owed, the Lord blessed the house of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was over everything Potiphar had, had both in the house and in the fields. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and he had run out of the house, she called her household servant. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has brought to us to make us sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed to, for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story of his wife told him saying, this is how your slaves treated me. He burned with anger. So Joseph's master took him and put him in prison and placed a place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. And he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Okay, Dave. There you go. Thank you, Wes. Appreciate it. You know, it's uh, it seems that mankind really hasn't changed much over the years. <laughs> you know, visiting prostitutes and and uh, you know, tricking your father-in-law into getting you pregnant and doing crazy things like that. You know, it's uh, man is just really. Uh, Without God and and following God, you know, left to his own devices, man is destructive. Uh, that's his nature, and it's very strange, but it is what it is. Okay, if you will please stand one more time. Take up your hymnals and turn to page 65. On page 65, we'll sing our third hymn, which comes to us from Psalm 84. 
titled How Lovely Are Thy Dwellings, after which we'll have our main message, which is part two of the reading of the fourth commandment. Um, I think we may be able to cover this in two parts. It'll be kind of a long. Um, I'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, but uh, if not, we'll cover it in three. So, uh, page 65, How Lovely Are Thy Dwellings, after which the main message, part two of reading the fourth commandment. Okay, if <clears throat> you'll be seated, we'll now have our main message, part two of uh, reading the fourth commandment. I have posted the link there in the chat in case anybody wants to follow along in the paper. And we are at the bottom of the right-hand column um, on page 13 under the heading, The New Moons. So with that, we'll carry on with our main message. Revelation 20, verse 5. The Sabbath is a delight, is to be honored as the holy day of Jehovah. It is not a day of idle pleasure, but one of sacred assembly. Isaiah 58, 13 to 14. No work done for income and no unnecessary burdens are to be carried on it. Jeremiah 17, 21 and 22. And on it we are neither to buy nor Nehemiah 10.31, nor sell. Nehemiah 13.15, on the seventh day, Sabbath. The new moons. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. As for as the new moons and the new mo earth which I make shall remain before me, says Jehovah, so shall your descendants, your name, remain. From new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come and worship before me, says Jehovah. All of humanity is commanded to attend the inner court and worship on both the seventh day Sabbath and the new moon Sabbath. Ezekiel 46, 1 to 10, thus says Jehovah Elohim, the uh, gate of the inner court that faces east shall be shut for the six working days, but on the Sabbath day it shall be opened, and on the day of the new moon it shall be opened. The prince shall enter by the vestibule of the gate from without, and shall take his stand by the posts of the gate. 
The priest shall offer his burnt offering and his peace offerings and shall worship at the threshold of the gate. He shall go out, but the gate shall not be shut until evening. The people of the land shall worship at the entrance of that gate before Yehovah on the Sabbaths and on the new moons. The burnt offering that the prince shall offer uh, to Yehovah on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish, a ram without blemish, and the cereal offering with the ram shall be an ephah. As the cereal offering with the lamb shall be as much as he is able, together with a hen of oil, to each ephah. On the day of the new moon he shall offer a young bull without blemish, six lambs and a ram, which shall be without blemish, and a cereal offering he shall provide, an ephah with a bull, an ephah with the ram, as uh, with the lambs as much as he is able, together with the hen of oil, uh, to each ephah. When the prince enters, he shall go in by the vestibule of the gate. He shall go out by the same way. When the people of the land come before Yehovah at the appointed feast, he who enters by the north gate to worship shall go out by the south gate. He who enters by the south gate shall go out by the north gate. No one shall return by the way of the gate by which he entered, but each shall go straight ahead. When they go in, the prince shall go with them, and when they go out, he shall go out. Now the sacrifices on the new moons were greater than that of the Sabbath. Ezekiel 46, verse 4 and 6. There is no distinction made between the new moon and the weekly Sabbath, as both days are holy and no trading is permitted on either day. Amos 8, 5, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make ephah small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with these false balances. The significance of the sacrifices in regard to the new moons relates to the church and the councils of Israel. Unless the new moons are kept, it is impossible to understand God's calendar. The modern Jewish calendar with its postponements and crescent observation is not a correct calendar and obstructs the restoration. God's feasts are set by the natural astronomical cycle. When they are done incorrect or set incorrectly with the postponements, the feasts and the new moons cannot be kept on the correct day, and so the restoration is delayed. Only by restoring the new moons at the conjunction can the calendar and the feast be kept correctly and therefore properly understood. The new moon is one of the memorials. Numbers 10.10 10. On the day of your gladness and also, also, and at your appointed feasts, and the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings, over the sacrifices, and your peace offerings. They shall serve you for remembrance before God. Uh, I am Jehovah, your Elohim. The sacrifices were fulfilled in Christ. The Sabbaths, new moons, and set feasts were not eliminated. We must not agree with those who bring, a, uh, bring us to a negative judgment regarding the keeping of the new moons. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or in regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but their substance belongs to Christ. A feast of the new moon was treated as a Shabbat on, or holy Sabbath. Sacrifices were offered as a memorial, as we saw above. Numbers 28, 11 to 15. At the beginnings of your months, you shall offer a burnt offering to Jehovah, two young bulls, one ram, seven male lambs a year old without blemish. Also three tenths of an ephah of fine flour for each cereal offering, mixed with oil for each bull, two tenths of fine flour for a cereal offering, mixed with oil for one ram, a tenth of fine flour mixed with oil as a cereal offering for every lamb, burnt offering of a pleasing odor, an offering by fire to Jehovah. Their drink offering shall be half a hen of wine for a bull, third of a hen of, for a ram, fourth of a hen for a lamb. This is the burnt offering for each month throughout the months of the year. Also a male goat for a sin offering to Jehovah shall be offered besides a continual burnt offering and its drink offering. We know from this text in verses uh, 11 and 14 
that the new moons were to be observed as holy to be on every month throughout the year, not just the first and seventh month. The seventh, the same requirements apply to new moons as they do to other feasts and Sabbaths. First Chronicles 23, 31. Whenever burnt offerings uh, were offered to Jehovah on Sabbaths, new moon, and feast days, according to the number required of them continually before Jehovah. New moons are intermediary between the Sabbaths and the feasts. Second Chronicles 31.3 The contribution of the king from his possessions was for the holocausts, the, the, the burnt offerings of morning and evening, and the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, new moons, appointed feasts, as it is written in the law of Jehovah. Ezra 3.5 also notes that the new moons were restored. Both uh, major restorations involve the restoration of the new moons. Ezra 3, 5, and after the continual burnt offerings, the offering of the new moon and all the appointed feasts of Jehovah, the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to Jehovah. The new moon is the beginning or the first day of the month. Numbers 10, 10, and chapter 28, verse 11. The lunar calendar is the mark of the holy people. In its notation to Exodus 12, 2, the Melchilda states that the nations reckon by the sun, but Israel by the moon. And the reference is Psalm 104, 19. The, the Sabbaths and new moons together both required rest from work, as we, as we read in, in Amos 8, 5. It was to be a day of rejoicing. If When it was kept in the wrong days or in the wrong ways, the mirth intended for the holy days, new moons, and Sabbaths is removed. Hosea 2.11 I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her appointed feasts. This was because of unfaithfulness and idolatry. God destroys his people because they do not keep his laws. The end result is that he will destroy the wealth of the nation. Hosea 2.12 And I will lay waste her vines, her fig trees, of which she said, These are my hire which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. Exodus 1.14 shows that God set lights in the heavens to determine the days and the nights as signs for the seasons. The new moons determine the order and the timing of the feasts and proceed, logically precede the Sabbath, which uh, represents the act of completion as the seventh day, whereas the moons commence from the fourth day. The lights are to separate light from darkness, Genesis 1.18. The moon demonstrates the light of the world within the darkness that rules it. The sun is used to depict Christ, uh, see in Malachi 4.2-4. For you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in its wings. You shall go forth leaping like calves into the stall, from the stall. You shall tread down the wicked. They shall be ashes under your soles of your feet on the day when I act as Jehovah Sabaoth. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. The term translated wings above refers to the borders of Christ's garment, which, when touched in faith, made one well. Matthew 9, 20 to 22. The fear of Jehovah is a remembrance of the law of God. The Sabbaths and the new moons were treated in the same way in regard to the conduct of our business. Conduct of commerce or of buying and selling was prohibited on both the new moon and the Sabbath. Profaning the new moons and Sabbaths is linked to the spiritual attitude of exploitation. Amos 8, 4-5 Hear this, you who trample on the needy, and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we can sell grain the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make an ephah small and a shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the refuse of the wheat. The months are 12 in all, with a 13th or intercalary month added seven times in every 19-year 19 uh, 19 cycle of the year. 
The sequence of the calendars established by God in the creation is determined by the movement and position of the heavenly bodies. This is de developed throughout the Bible and is central to the law. Psalm 104:19, you made the moon to mark its seasons, the sun to know the time for setting. The moon is the determinant factor, not the sun. The sun is operative uh, for the day only and is a pivot for the beginning of the year from the equinox or turn of the year at Exodus 34, 22, from the word tekufa, um, Strong's Hebrew Dictionary 86, 22, meaning coming around, circuit of time or space, a turning, a circuit. Uh, circuit is an adverb. Now, for Israel and all the people in the northern hemisphere, winter solstice is the time when December, when the sun reaches its nor uh, southernmost latitude. At this time, we have the shortest day, typically around the 21st, 22nd of December. Anciently, the, the winter solstice was on our December 25th, and false gods like Mithras were assigned this day as a birthday. Summer solstice is a time in June when the sun reaches its uh, northernmost latitude. At this time, we have the longest day, typically nowadays, around the 21st or 22nd of June. Vernal equinox is the time in March when the sun passes the equator, moving from the southern to the northern hemisphere, when the day and night have approximately the same length. The date for this equinox is typically around 20th, 21st of March. Anciently, the equinox was on the March 25th, and this was carried to Great Britain and was used as their false New Year's Day until 700, several hundred years ago. Uh, the autumnal equinox is uh, the time in September when the sun passes through the equator, moving from the northern to the southern hemisphere, again when day and night have approximately the same length, typically around the 21st, 22nd of September. The tropical year is 365.24219 days, and a synodic month is 29.53059 days. The, the, the uh, 19 tropical solar years is close to the integral numbers of synodic months. The actual length of a particular year may vary by several minutes due to the influence of gravitational force from other planets. Similarly, when the time between two new moons may vary by several hours due to a number of factors, including changes in the uh, gravitational force, the effects of the sun, and from the moon's orbital inclination. The 19 years mark the complete cycle. The moons themselves determine this period as they rotate through the seasons. <coughs> the uh, start of the month is not set from seeing a first crescent moon, which is extremely variable and makes it impossible to publish a calendar with the day holy days identified. The year begins in the spring with the first day of the first month established from the conjunction during Jerusalem's time. This month is the first month that has the 15th day, the Passover, categorized as a full moon, which follows the vernal equinox. The new moon may thus be up to 13 days before the equinox. There's a quote. The uh, Passover festival is to be celebrated at the full moon in the month of Nisan. Uh, should uh, if the 14th of Nisan should in any case fall after the vernal equinox when the sun stood in the sign of Aries. This explanation is characterized by Anatolius in a fragment of decided importance in relation to the history of the Jewish calendar given in Eusebius. History, Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 7, uh, of 32, 16 and 19, it characterizes this as the unanimous view of all the Jewish authorities. So at the time of Eusebius, it was unanimously understood this way. Now with this also agrees the statements of Philo and Josephus. If one noticed, therefore, that close, uh, toward the close of the year noticed that the Passover would fall before the vernal equinox, the intercalation of a month before Nisan, or the, or the first month of the year, would have to be resorted to from Schur, The History of the Jewish People in the Time of Jesus Christ, 1st Division, Volume 2, Appendix 3. 
this important rule for determining the new year will not be found in Scripture, and this includes the Sabbath day and new moon. Historical references must be evaluated and applied. However, the start of the year rule is still followed by Roman Catholics about 1,800 years in determining their Easter. In 2005, the Easter coincided with the true wave sheaf on Sunday on the 27th of March. The European Trinitarians saw no conflict here because the Jews were one month late for celebrating of the wave sheaf, as in 1997. It was late in 1997 in order to accommodate the rabbinically designated but astronomically meaningless blessing of the sun. This is a modern tradition that causes all of Judah to sin. The wave chief as first of the first fruits uh, could not be kept in what was in fact the second month commencing in April. Judaism did not and could not keep it as the barley harvest was completed by the middle of what was the second month of that year. So the start of the month of the conjunction is critical to understanding when the new year begins. The start of the year is not contingent on the ripeness of barley in modern day Israel. This can vary by many weeks in any given year. This again makes it impossible to publish a calendar with the holy days identified. This looking for a sign falls into the category of looking for a, sec, a, a crescent or, or looking for a crescent or looking for a full moon on which to base these critical cycles and days. People today are using modern grains that ripen at different rates and are very different from the primitive grains. Some people actually plant them in protected environments to be close to accommodating their assumptions. Even then, certain conditions can alter their desired effects. Now, Noah entered and the ark was closed, Jeremiah, or Genesis 7, 16. But at the flood's end, he knew when the New Year's Day occurred. He then removed the covering of the ark, Genesis 8, 13. And this knowledge of the New Year's Day was not based on visual signs and certainly was not based on a barley harvest near Jerusalem at the end of the flood. The year 2005 was the seventh or sabbatical year in which we did not plant annuals. In the millennium, no one will plant an annual gain, grain like barley, and thus no one will be able to see what is the state of the growth of green ears during March, April, and a seventh or jubilee year. This knowledge is not and cannot be required to start the year or to identify the subsequent feasts and holy days. Now, the practical application. The new moons are required to be kept under the law. Numbers 10:10, 10, 10, 28:11 to 15, First Chronicles 23:31, Second Chronicles 2:4, 8:13, and uh, chapter 31, verse 3. Trading is suspended at this time as for the Sabbath. Amos 8:5. Israel kept the new moons. Isaiah 1:13 and 14. Ezra 3:5. Nehemiah 10.33, Psalms 81.3, Hosea 2.11, as did the church over the centuries. The church kept the new moons with the Sabbath and holy days, as you see in Colossians 2, verse 16. The new moons will be kept as a Sabbath and the restoration under Messiah, Isaiah 66.23, Ezekiel 45.17, and chapter 46, 1, 3, and 6. They are incumbent upon us now. The new moon is a commanded observant even before the holy days, which they establish as a set time. Psalm 81, 3. This day is observed from the conjunction of the lunar astronomical cycle, which takes place during Jerusalem's time zone, Isaiah 2, 3 and is not according to the observation, Psalm 104, 19. So the holy days and feasts. Uh, the annual holy days are found in Leviticus 23, 1 to 44, Numbers 28, 16, uh, 29, and uh, 35. The, in Deuteronomy 16, uh, verses 1 to 16. These annual holy days are mandatory days of an, a sacred assembly. Leviticus 23, 4. They are memorials. 
Leviticus 23:43, and they mirror the plan of salvation of Jehovah. The annual seven holy days are first day of unleavened bread, Leviticus 23:7, Numbers 28:18, Deuteronomy 16:1 to 8. The last day of unleavened bread, Leviticus 23:8, Numbers 28:25. Deuteronomy 16, 3 and 8. Pentecost, Leviticus 23, 21. Numbers 28, 26. Um, and Deuteronomy 16, verses uh, 9 to 12. The uh, trumpets, Leviticus 23, 23. Numbers 29, 1. Atonement, Leviticus 23, 26. Numbers 29, 7. Tabernacles, Leviticus 23, 35, Numbers 29, 12, and Deuteronomy 16, 13 to 15. And the last great day, Leviticus 23, 35, and Numbers 29, verse 35. So there are three annual feasts, Exodus 3, 14, Deuteronomy 16, 16 and 17. The timing of these feasts is set or fixed. Ezra 3, 5, Nehemiah 10, 33. The word set is from Moed, Strong's Hebrew Dictionary 41, 50. It means appointed time. These feasts, these feast days cannot be postponed by back-to-back -back Sabbaths and holy days. First is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which has two holy days, namely Passover on the 15th day and the last day of Unleavened Bread on the 21st day of the first month, this uh, first 36 hours of Passover, including the Lord's Supper and the meal of the 15th, may not be held at home or within your gates, Deuteronomy 16, 5 to 7. This meal is a physical representation of the spiritual declaration that our Father Eloah will reconcile and redeem all of his creation. Second is the Feast of Harvest, or Weeks, or the Holy Day of Pentecost. Exodus 23:16, which is 50 days following the way sheaf offering on the first day of the week of the Roman holiday within unleavened bread. This uh, third is the Feast of, of Tabernacles, or in gathering, Exodus 23:16, and see in Numbers 29:12 to 40. With the 15th day of the seventh month as a holy day as well as one on the last great day as the English day of this, as the eighth day of this feast. Numbers 29, <clears throat> verses 12 to 40. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work, and you shall keep a feast to Jehovah seven days. You shall offer a burnt offering, an offering by fire, a pleasing odor to Jehovah, 13 young bulls, 2 rams, 14 male lambs, a year old, and they shall be without blemish. And their cereal offering of fine flour mixed with oil, 3 tenths of an ephah for each of the 13 bulls, 2 tenths for each of the 2 rams, and a tenth for each of the 14 rams, uh, 14 lambs. Also, the t a male goat for a sin offering besides the continual burnt offering is cereal offering and a drink offering. On the second day, 12 young bulls, two rams, 14 male lambs, a year old without blemish, with a cereal offering, drink offering for the bulls, for the rams, and for the lambs by number, according to the ordinance. Also, one male goat for a sin offering, besides the continual burnt offering, cereal offering, and drink offerings. On the third day, offer 11 bulls, two rams, 14 male lambs, a year old without blemish, and with the cereal offering, the drink offering for the bulls, the rams, the lambs, by number, according to the ordinance. Also, one <clears throat> male goat for a sin offering, besides the continual burnt offering, a cereal offering, and a drink offering. <clears throat> On the fourth day, ten bulls, two rams, fourteen male lambs, a year old, without blemish, and the cereal offering... And the drink offerings for the bulls, rams, lambs by number according to the ordinance. Also one male lamb for a sin offering, besides the continual burnt offering, a cereal offering, drink offering. On the fifth day, nine bulls, two rams, fourteen male lambs without blemish. Um, 
with the cereal offering on the drink offerings for the bulls, rams, lambs by number according to the ordinance. Also, one male goat for a sin offering, besides the continual burnt offering with the cereal offerings and his drink offerings on the sixth day, eight bulls, two rams, 14 male lambs, a year old without blemish, and with a cereal offering, the drink offerings of the bulls, rams, lambs by number according to their um, according to the ordinance. Also, one male goat for a sin offering, besides the continual burnt offering, his cereal offerings, and his drink offerings. On the seventh day, seven bulls, two rams, 14 male lambs, a year old, without blemish, with a cereal offering, drink offerings for the bulls, rams, lambs by number, according to the ordinance. Also, one male goat for a sin offering, besides the continual Holocausts is cereal offering and its drink offering. On the eighth day, you shall have a solemn assembly. You shall do no laborious work, and you shall offer a holocaust by f offering by fire, a pleasing odor to Yehovah, one bull, one ram, seven male lambs a year old without a blemish, cereal offering, drink offerings for the bull, rams, lambs, uh, by number according to the ordinances. Also, one male goat for a sin offering, besides the continual burnt offering, and a cereal offering and a drink offering. Uh, these you shall offer to Yehovah at your appointed feast, in addition to your votive or free offerings, and your free or your votive offerings and your free will offerings for your holocaust, for your cereal offerings, for your drink offerings, for your peace offerings. And Moses told the people of Israel everything as Jehovah had commanded him. The tithe system is tied to the feast and operates within the complete jubilee system. Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 29, you shall tithe all the yield of your seed which comes from the field year by year. For the Jehovah, your God, in the place he will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, your wine, of your oil, the firstlings of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear Yehovah your God always. And if the way is too long for you, and you are not able to bring your tithe, when Yehovah your God blesses you, because the place is too far from you, which Yehovah your God chooses, to set his name there, you shall turn it into money, bind up the money in your hand, Go to the place which Yehovah your God chooses. Spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen, sheep, wine, strong drink, whatever your appetite craves. And you shall eat there before Yehovah your Elohim and rejoice, you and your household. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. At the end of every three years, you shall bring forth all the tithe of your produce in the same year. Lay it up within your town. For the Levite, because he has no portion with you or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless widow who are within your town, shall come and eat and be filled. And Jehovah, your, uh, your God, may bless you in the work of your hands that you do. Now, the second tithe is, is to be used for attendance at the feast, except in the third year where the distance is too great. Deuteronomy 12.21, If the place that Yehovah your God will choose to put his name there is too far from you, you may kill any of your herd or your flock, which Yehovah has given you as I have commanded, and you may eat it within your towns as much as you desire. Those who are not prepared to take the Passover or who are traveling are to take the Passover in the second month, Numbers 9, 6 to 12, 2 Chronicles 32 to 4. Numbers 9, 1 to 23. <clears throat> Yehovah spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. In the first month of the second year, after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the people come out of, out of Israel, keep the Passover at its appointed time. On the fourteenth day of this month, in the evening, you shall keep it. At its appointed time, according to a statutes, ordinances, you shall keep it. So they told, uh, so Moses told the people of Israel that they should keep the Passover. 
They kept the Passover in the 13th month on the 14th day of the month in the evening in the wilderness in Sinai, according to all that, that uh, Yehovah had commanded Moses. So the people of Israel did, and there were certain men who were unclean through touching <clears throat> the dead body of a man, so they could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and Aaron on that day, and these men said to him, We are unclean through touching a dead body of a man. Why are we kept from offering Yehovah's offering at the appointed time among the people of Israel? And Moses said to them, Wait, that I may hear what Yehovah will command concerning you. Yehovah said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, If any of you or your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body, or is afar off on a journey, he shall still keep the Passover to Yehovah. In the second month, on the fourteenth day in the evening, they shall keep it. And they shall keep eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall uh, leave none of it until morning, nor break a bone of it. According to all the statutes of the Passover, they shall keep it. But the man who is clean and not on a journey and refrains from keeping the Passover, that person shall be cut off from his people because he did not offer Jehovah's offering at the appointed time. <clears throat> that man shall bear his sin. And if a stranger sojourns with you and will keep the Passover to Jehovah according to the statute of the Passover and according to its ordinances, so he shall do. You shall have one statute, both for the sojourner and for the native. On the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony, and at evening it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was continually, and the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whatever the cloud was taken up from over the tent, after that the people of Israel set out. Uh, in the place where the clouds settled down, there the people of Israel encamped, and at the command of Yehovah, the people of Israel set out. At the command of Yehovah, they encamped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. And even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle's many day, the people of Israel were kept the charge of Yehovah and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle. According to the command of Yehovah, they remained in camp. Uh, then, according to the command of Yehovah, they set out. Sometimes the cloud would remain from evening until morning. And when the cloud was taken up in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud was taken up, they set out. So whether it was two days or a month or a longer time that the cloud continued over the tabernacles abiding there, the people of Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it was taken up, they set out. At the command of Yehovah, they encamped. At the command of Yehovah, they set out. They kept the charge of Yehovah at the command of Yehovah by Moses. It is important for everyone to keep the Passover, and even strangers who are living in Israel are also to celebrate the Passover. Exodus 12, 48 and 9, Numbers 9, verse 14. <clears throat> so Exodus 12, 29 to 51. At midnight, Yehovah smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon. All the firstborn of the cattle. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where one was not dead. And he summoned Moses and Aaron by night, Rise up, go forth from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, go, serve Yehovah as you have said. Take your flocks, your herds, as you have said, and be gone. And bless me also. So the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we are all dead men. So the, so the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their mantles on their shoulders, the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked of the Egyptians jewelry of silver and of gold and of clothing. 
they, uh, Yahweh had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they let them have whatever they asked. Thus they despoiled the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very many cattle, flocks, and herds. Uh, they baked unleavened cakes of dough, which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any provisions. Uh, the time that the people of Israel dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on the very day, all the hosts of the Yehovah went out from the land of Egypt. It was a light of watching by Yehovah to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to Yehovah by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. Yehovah said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No sojourner or hired servant may eat of it. No one house in one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry forth any of the flesh outside your house. You shall not break a bone of it. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. When a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover, uh, let, um, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and one for the stranger who sojourn amongst you. Thus did all the people of Israel, as Jehovah commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did it. On that day, Jehovah brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Now, this salvation includes the salvation of the Gentiles, meaning all of mankind, who will be in the congregation. If we are baptized and receive the Holy Spirit, then we are, we are circumcised and clean. This exclude, includes all women who are not to be excluded from the Lord's Supper, Passover meal, Sabbath, and feast because of their natural menstrual cycle. The feast is to be celebrated at a place designated by God throughout through the Melchizedek priesthood, Deuteronomy 16, 5 to 7, and is to be celebrated with unleavened bread, Exodus 12, 8, 15 to, 9, 15 to 20, 12, verses 3 and 6, 23, verse 15, Leviticus 23, 6, Numbers 9, 11, 28, 17, Deuteronomy 16, 3 to 4, Mark 14, uh, verse 12, Luke 22, 7, Acts 12, 3, and 1 Corinthians 5, 8. The penalty for neglecting to observe the feast is to be cut off uh, from the people or the congregation. Numbers 9, 13. Except we're unclean or on a journey, there is one statute for both stranger and sojourner. Numbers 9, 14, and it is not to be kept at home. Deuteronomy 16, 5 to 7, you may not offer this Passover sacrifice within any of your towns which Jehovah gives to you, but will, but at the place which Jehovah, uh, your God, will choose to make his name dwell there, there you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in evening at the going down of the sun at the time uh, you came out of Egypt. And you shall bo uh, roast and eat it at the place uh, where Yehovah, your God, will choose. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. The law of Deuteronomy 16.5 was the reason Christ sent his disciples out to find the room described in Matthew 26, uh, verses uh, 17 to 19. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain one and say to him, the teacher uh, says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. 
Now, on the wave sheaf offering, the sign of Jonah required that it be completed exactly in all its phases. The first phase was that Christ was in the grave three days, three nights, no more, no less. Christ also had to be resurrected before morning of the first day of the week following the weekly Sabbath because he was the wave or sheaf offering, when he, uh, which was the first fruits of all of the harvests. Exodus 29, 24 to 27. And see Leviticus 7, uh, verses 30 and 34. 8, uh, verses 27 and 29. 9, 21. 10, 14, and 15, 14, 12, and 24, 23, 11 to 20, Numbers 5, 25, 6, 20, 18, 11, and verse 18. Now, <clears throat> Exodus 29, verses 24 to 27. You shall put all these in the hands of Aaron, the hands of his sons, wave them for a wave offering before Jehovah. Then you shall take them from their hands, burn them on the altar in addition to the burnt offering for a pleasing odor before Jehovah. It is a offering made by fire to Jehovah. You shall take the breast of the ram of Aaron's ordination and wave it for a wave offering before Jehovah, and it shall be your portion. You shall consecrate the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the priest's portion, which is waved, which is offered from the ram of ordination, which is for Aaron and all his sons. The wave sheaf was offered at 9 a.m. or the third hour. He was waiting to ascend, which is the reason Christ said to Mary when she came to see him, or Miriam, do not touch or hold me. John 20, verse 1 and 15 to 17. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early when it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Tell me if you have carried him away. Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Miriam, and she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Uh, Jesus said to her, Do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Go to my brethren and say to them, I am assembling to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Only after his acceptance as a sacrifice and his subsequent return did he allow himself to be touched. John 20, verse 27. Now, the first day of the week, our, our modern day of the Sunday, way sheaf offering is not a holy day, but it must be kept as it commences the count to Pentecost. The assemblies of Eloah keep the time as your local 9 a.m. for uniformity of worship throughout the world. Neither of the holy days of trumpets or atonement is part of the festivals that include the offertory systems. Uh, three feasts a year, Exodus 23, 14. Three times a year you shall keep a feast to me, Exodus, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times a year all your males shall appear before Jehovah your God at the place he shall choose at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the time of the, uh, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths. Those attending the feast shall not appear before Jehovah empty-handed. Deuteronomy 16, 16 and 17, they shall not appear before the God, before Yehovah empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of Yehovah your God, which he has given you. So the feasts are the Passover, Days of Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, or booths. And there are three times a year to make an offering. This must be done at the beginning or before morning of the first day of each of the three feasts. Exodus 23, 14. Commanded offerings may not be demanded of Christians on every holy day or at weekly meetings. Free will offerings are between the individual and God and may be made at any time, but are to be made without any form of compulsion. Feast offerings were to be made weeks in advance with some of the livestock and grain 
and fruit selections taking place. In this way, suitable offerings could be used at the feast. They were evaluated. Cash and checks are perfectly acceptable as free will offerings and for the commanded festival offerings and tithes. Ezra 8, 25 to 30. And I weighed out to them the silver, meaning uh, uh, money, the gold and the vessels and the offering for the house of our God, which king and counselors and his lords of all Israel were present and had offered. So m money, cash, gold, silver, and bronze, everything was offered. And it's, it's a, not to be disdained by, as some do. So I weighed out into their hands 650 talents of silver, silver vessels worth 100 talents, 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold worth 1,000 dariacs, two vessels of fine bronze, precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy to Yehovah. The vessels are holy. The silver and the gold are a free will offering, a teruma levy, meaning a contribution offering for sacred uses to Yehovah. The God of your fathers, watch and keep them until you weigh them before the leading priests, the Levites, and the heads of the fathers' households of Israel at Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of Jehovah. Now the priests and the Levites accepted the weighed out silver and the utensils to bring them to Jerusalem to the house of God. Now Numbers 31 verses 50 to 54. And we have brought Jehovah's offering, or Korban, uh, Strong's Hebrew Dictionary 7133, meaning offering or oblation, what each man found, articles of gold, armlets, bracelets, signet rings, earrings, beads, to make atonement for ourselves before Jehovah. The Moses and Eleazar, the priests, received them, received from them the gold and all the wrought articles. And all the gold of the offering, or the teruma, uh, that they offered to Yehovah from the commanders of thousands, the commanders of hundreds, and 16,750 shekels. Now the men of war had taken booty, every man for himself. Moses and Eleazar received the gold from the commanders of thousands, hundreds, and brought it to the tent of meeting as a memorial for the people of Israel before Yehovah. Numbers 3, 44 to 51. And Yehovah uh, spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the sons of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites, <clears throat> and the Levites shall be mine. I am Yehovah for the ransom of the 273 of the firstborn of the sons of Israel, who are in excess beyond the Levites. You shall take five shekels each per head, <clears throat> and you shall take them in turns of the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 geraz. Give the money, the ransom of those who are in excess of them, to Aaron and to his sons. So Moses took the ransom money um, from those who were in excess beyond those ransomed by the Levites. From the firstborn of the sons of Israel, he took the money in terms of the shekel of the sanctuary. Then Moses gave them ransom money uh, to Aaron and to his sons at the command of Jehovah, just as Jehovah had commanded Moses. The priests used the source of cash to hire the workmen, the choir, and others paid in the temple service. They were paid in cash, and they would have tithed in cash. Second uh, Kings um, 12, 1 to 19. Ezra verses six, Ezra six verse eight, Jeremiah twenty two thirteen, and uh, James five four. The Exodus twenty five one to three, Yehovah said to Moses, "Speak to the children of Israel, that they um, take for me an offering from every man whose heart makes him willing. They shall receive the offering um, for me, and this is the offering which you shall receive from them." gold, silver, and bronze. That is, gold, silver, and bronze, or copper coins, is are much easier to carry and had an assigned value that worked bowls, utensils, and similar items did not have. Deuteronomy 14, 24 to 25. 
So trumpets is called a memorial Sabbath and a holy gathering. Leviticus 23, 24, Numbers 29, 1 to 6. On the first day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. It is a day for you to blow trumpets, and on the um, and you shall offering a holocaust, a pleasing order to Jehovah, one young bull, one ram, seven male lambs a year old without blemish, also their cereal offering of fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an ephah for the bull, two tenths for the ram, one tenth for each of the seven rams uh, lambs, and one male goat for a sin offering to make atonement for you. Besides the burnt offering of the new moon, its cereal offering, continual burnt offering, cereal offering, and their drink offerings, according to the ordinance for them, a pleasing odor, uh, an offering by fire to Jehovah. Atonement is called a Sabbatai Sabbath. And a holy gathering, Leviticus 23, 27 to 32, Numbers 29, verses 7 to 9, uh, 7 to 11. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. Afflict yourselves, you shall do no work, but you shall offer a burnt offering to Yahweh, <clears throat> a pleasing odor, one young bull, one ram, seven male lambs, a year old, and they shall be to you without blemish. And their cereal offering, a fine flour mixed with oil, three tenths of an ephah for the bull, two tenths for the one ram, a tenth for each of the seven lambs, a male goat for a sin offering besides the sin, uh, sin offering of atonement and the continual burnt offering, a cereal offering, and their drink offering. So both at trumpets and atonement are called holy days and not feasts. Numbers 10.10 10 gives you occasions when the trumpets or shofar um, were blown on all of the new moons and all of the holy days and Sabbaths when the burnt and peace offerings were made. We also blow the shofar as a summons to the army of God to receive its battle orders during the Sabbath services. The biblical holy days and feasts were found in, Le are found in Leviticus 23, and there we find a fuller explanation than the extension in, of Exodus. Exodus 23 expands on Exodus 20. Leviticus 23 amplifies Exodus and Numbers 15, 28, and 29 amplify both. Now this including the new moons. Further reiteration and application occur in Deuteronomy 5 and 14. So the, the power of Christ relates to the power to keep the law in the Holy Spirit and hence through grace. Uh, being under God's grace and being under his favor because we keep the co commandments uh, and so do not sin, Romans 6. Kept, Christ kept all the Sabbaths, new moons, and feasts. The apostolic church also kept the Sabbaths, new moons, and feasts, Colossians 2.16, as has the church of God for over 2,000 years. The nations in the millennium will also keep these Sabbaths, new moons, and feasts, Isaiah 60, 66.23. Uh, Zechariah 14, 16 and 9 to 19. Now the important dis the connection between the feasts and the sacrifices noted in Deuteronomy 12, 8 to 14 was abolished along with the connection between the sacrifices and the weekly Sabbath. One cannot link the calendar and feasts and the same and the sacrificial law without applying the same concept to all other aspects of the law, including the Sabbath. All of the system of God's government was free from the sacrificial requirements, including the Sabbath, holy day systems. The Passover itself was introduced before the law, was given at Sinai. Christ is the Passover sacrifice, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. No animal sacrifice can now be made to cover our sin. The entire process <coughs> of the introduction of the elect within Christianity, Christianity is predicated on the Holy Day sequence occurring and up until the general resurrection. The Holy Days cannot be abolished until the last great day completes this portion of the plan. Each feast represents an ongoing part of the plan of God that is still unfolding. 
by definition of the harvest system, they are still required and unfolding. 1 Peter 2, 5, And the living stones be yourselves built into a spiritual house and be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The elect presently are the spiritual sacrifices. The law was a shadow or foreshadow of things to come. Hebrews 10, 1. The shadow shows the reality and is not removed from it. There can be no shadow without that which was casting it. The shadow was tied specifically to the sacrifices, Hebrews 10, 1 to 10, and not to the feasts. The Bible holds that the blemishes on the feasts are caused by those in the body who abandon themselves for the sake of gain into Balaam's error, to perish in Korah's rebellion, Jude 11 and 12, or Jude, verses 11 and 12. In other words, they teach for hire and pervert the feasts and the understanding of the law and the testimony. There is no light, Isaiah 8.20, or dawn in the RSV, in them. They are twice dead, uprooted. These people are devoid of the Spirit, set up divisions in the last days, Jude verse 19. Korah's rebellion is an ongoing assault. The elect are judged by their knowledge of the one true God through the knowledge of God, Jeremiah 9, 24, and the understanding of the law flows and becomes entrenched within the mind not, and the heart of the individual. The issue is not the Sabbaths, new moons, and feasts, or the law in uh, keeping of the covenant. It is the fact that God, the Father, is the one and only true God, John 17, 3, 1 John 5, 20, that he alone is immortal or has life inherent, he is life, doesn't have life. 1 Timothy 6, 16. One can keep the Sabbath and still be a heretic. If we do not hold fast to the truth, we will be removed from the elect and given over to a strong delusion and the belief in a lie. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11. Marshall's interlinear translate this part of the verse as operation of error. So they, they uh, believe a lie, that is, they can no longer help themselves any longer and cannot understand even if they wanted to see their error. The purpose and plan of God is revealed by the structure and the sequences of the feast and the uh, established in the ordinances of God. Outline of the plan of God. A Trinitarian Christianity does not adhere to these feasts, consequently is without direction, and um, understanding concerning the biblical plan. These churches are disregarding the instructions which the Bible commands for the protection of society through the family structure. Centralized governments cannot replace the family and the protective jubilee system. Uh, Micah 4, 3, and 4. The laws governing the feasts occur in four sequences in the Pentateuch from Exodus to Deuteronomy. The first sequence is found in, in Exodus, Exodus 20 and deals with the Ten Commandments, repeated in Deuteronomy 5. Exodus 21 deals with the questions of marriage, household, family responsibility that amplifies the structure of the commandments within all these types of societies. Exodus 22 deals with the extension of property rights and commercial activities and obligation under the commandments. Exodus 23 deals with false witness, respect of persons, extension of the Tenth Commandment. Exodus 23.10 then takes the Fourth Commandment, broadens it to show its application in the structure of the society. Not only does it relate to the weak, but it also involves the Jubilee and the complete sabbatical system. And Exodus 12 deals with the Passover. So these were the feasts of Jehovah. He called them my feasts, Leviticus 23.2. They are referred to as a feast of the Lord, feast of Jehovah in Exodus 23, 2 Chronicles 2, 4. The term your feast was also used in Numbers 15, 3, 29, 39. The term their feast is used in Isaiah 1, 14 and 5, 12 in a negative aspect as below. Uh, the feasts were not secular or earthly provenance. They could not logically be changed or abandoned unless a plan of salvation which they, had, which they represent, had also been changed or abandoned. So Leviticus 23, 1 to 44. Um, Yehovah said to Moses, 
say to the people of Israel, the appointed feast of Yehovah, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed feasts are these. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath, a solemn rest, a holy convocation, and you shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to Yehovah and all your dwellings. These are the appointed feasts of Yehovah, the holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, in the evening, is Yehovah's Passover. On the fifteenth day of the same month is a feast of unleavened bread. To Yehovah, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. The first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to Yehovah seven days. And on the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. And Yehovah said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, When you come onto the land which I give you and you reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priests. He shall wave the the sheaf before Yehovah, and that you may find acceptance. On the morrow after the wave, after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. On the, on the day that you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old, without blemish, as a holocaust to Yehovah. And the cereal offering with it shall be two tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil, be offered by fire to Yehovah. A pleasing odor, and the drink offering with it shall be wine, a fourth of a hen. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering to of your God. It is a statute. It is a statute forever throughout all your generations in all your dwellings. You shall count from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven full weeks they shall be, counting fifty days to the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall pre present a cereal offering of new grain to Yehovah. You shall bring from your dwellings two loaves of bread to be waved, made with two ephahs of uh, two tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. As first fruits to Yehovah, you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old, without blemish, one young bull, two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to Yehovah, with their cereal offering, their drink offering, uh, an offering by fire, a pleasing odor to Yehovah. You shall offer one male goat for a sin offering. The two male lambs a year old is a sacrifice of peace offerings. The priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before Yehovah. With two lambs they shall be holy to Yehovah for the priest. You shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. It is a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field to its very border. Nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am Yehovah, your Elohim. And Yehovah said to Moses, Say to all the people of Israel in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no laborious work. <clears throat> you shall present an offering by fire to Yehovah, and Yehovah said to Moses, On the tenth day of the seventh month is a day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation. You shall afflict yourselves and present an offering by fire to Yehovah. You shall do no work on the same day. It is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before Yehovah your God. Whoever is not afflicted on this same day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on the same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no work. It is a statute forever throughout all your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a, sal a Sabbath, a solemn rest. You shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of, of the month, beginning at even. And from evening to evening you shall keep your Sabbath. 
And Yehovah said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel on the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days it is a feast of booths to Yehovah, and on the first day shall be a holy convocation, you shall do no laborious work. Seven days you shall present offerings by fire to Yehovah. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to Yehovah. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do no laborious work. These are the appointed feasts of Yehovah, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to Yehovah offerings by fire, holocausts, cereal offerings, sacrifices, drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Sabbaths of Yehovah, besides your gifts, besides your votive offerings, besides your free will offerings, which you give to Yehovah, on the 15th day of the seventh month, uh, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall keep the feast of Yehovah seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. On the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of leafy trees, willows of the brook. You shall rejoice before Yehovah your God seven days, and you shall keep it as a feast to Yehovah seven days in the year. It is a statute through forever throughout all your generations. You shall keep it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths or temporary dwellings for seven days. All that are native to Israel shall dwell in booths. And your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yehovah, your God. Thus M Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feast of Yehovah. Now Messiah was indeed the primary and essential part of the harvest of God, as portrayed by the Passover and the way sheaf offering. He had a pre-existence as the Elohim of Israel, subordinate to his old Elohim, who was Eloah. It was in this capacity he gave the law to Moses, and with whom he spoke face to face. Moses did not speak with God the Father, Eloah, or Ton Theon. Rather, he spoke to the Elohim, turned the angel of the presence, or the angel of great counsel. As you see in Isaiah 9, 6, in the Septuagint. The God gives the feast to Christ. Christ maintains and forces those structures within his elect as a first fruits and ultimately through the nations for the millennial system or structure. Numbers 28 and 9 contain the only complete list which includes the daily, weekly, monthly, annual sacrifices and offerings. The sacrifices were made because of what we are, that is, sinful, and offerings were made as a payment or a fine for what we do wrong. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Hebrews 13, 8, God is immutable. Malachi 3, 6, and James 1, 17. Neither change, therefore, the days they hold as sacred, for humanity as given by the law do not change. Sabbaths, new moons, holy days, and the feasts are impugned deliberately. This is a promise that God himself had made through the prophets. God spoke through the prophet Amos and likened Israel in the last days to a basket of summer fruit. Amos 8.1 The failure to obey God is a key element. The punishment for the failure to obey God is that the Sabbaths and feasts are turned into mourning and felt to be a burden. This was followed by a famine of hearing the word of Yehovah, uh, Amos 8, 11 to 14. Because of the failure to understand the nature of the one true God, and uh, the people are punished, Hosea 8, 5 to 9. Even the demons know that there is one God and tremble, James 2, 19. The great things of God's law are written for Israel. However, they counted on them as strange or they counted them as strange to their breach of the first covenant and their proliferation of sin in worship. Hosea 8, 11 to 14. This whole uh, chapter of John 6 is a sequence of symbolism re le uh, leading up to the preparation and to the Passover. There is a specific meaning in every sentence of John 6 
and how it prepares everyone for their calling, their placement in the elect, their placement in the tribes as part of the 144,000, and the multitude under the 12 apostles as judges of the tribes. There are three elements to, to this eternal life. They're normal, not uh, normally dealt with in the Lord's Supper. The first two elements are from John 17, 3. The first element is, this is eternal life, to have knowledge of you, the only true God, and of him whom you have sent, Jesus Christ. The Bible in basic English. The second element of eternal life is faith in Jesus Christ through knowledge of the one true God. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. The third element of eternal life is the participation in the Passover and the eating of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. John 6, 53 and 54. Now these are the three elements that we require to have eternal life. All of these three elements are predicated upon obedience. Obedience is to the one true God by keeping of his commandments. Deuteronomy 4, 2, 6, 17, 8, 6, 10, 13, 28, 9, Psalms 119, 115, Matthew 19, 17. The saints are those who keep the commandments, which include the statutes and judgments, Revelation 3, 10, 12, 17, 14, 12. Failure to keep the law brings condemnation, Romans 2, 27. Then those who are physically circum uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. Commandment keeping is the necessary prerequisite to the retention of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot enter the kingdom of God and thus have eternal life. So it is with these three elements of faith. We are then required to participate from obedience. Obedience to this festival entails the keeping of the laws and regulations that Christ set for participation in the Lord's Supper and the Passover meal. And if we do not take the ceremony, we have no part with Jesus Christ. John 17, 3, 17, verse 8. Now, the first ceremony of the Lord's Supper is the act of foot washing. Foot washing was conducted as an act of hospitality by a host when the guests arrived. People had normally bathed, but they had not. They had walked through the streets, and foot washing made them feel comfortable. It was the job of, of the lowliest servant to wash feet. The guest was provided with a towel and a urine of water. This washing, washing uh, normally took place on arrival or before the beginning of a meal while the guests were reclining at the table. And the dislike of tasks symbolized the fact that no one likes doing menial tasks for other people. John 13, 6 to 8, He came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. We probably all know these words by heart. Peter did not want him to wash his feet as he wanted a king messiah. He did not understand that the high priest first walked dressed in linen garments to atone and sacrifice, as seen during the Day of Atonement ceremonies in Leviticus 16.4. There were to be two messianic advents, one who was lowly in plain linen garments, the other who would be dressed in the apparel of a king. He wanted to sit Jesus Christ on the throne of the Caesars and rule this world just as the Caesars had unjustly done, but from Jerusalem. Isaiah 2, 3 and Micah 4, 2. Peter said, you're not going to wash my feet. We must allow our feet to be washed, feet to be washed, symbolizing our lives being washed clean by Jesus Christ on a continuing basis. If we are to have our part with him in the kingdom and indeed, everything that he does. If we do, we will inherit the kingdom as he did. Peter realized the necessity of the act, but not its significance. John 13, 9 to 11, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, it's not my feet only, but also my hands and head. Jesus said to him, he who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, for he is clean all over. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said, You are not all clean. 
We need only to have our feet rewashed as we were first bathed in the, bat- the waters of baptism, and so we're cleaned. At the Lord's Supper, we all need our feet to be annually rewashed. This re-cleanses our thinking before and about God, 1 Peter 3, 18 to 21, in order that we may then symbolically eat the body, er, eat the body and drink the blood. Spiritually, thinking, spiritually speaking, every year we collect sin, often unknowingly, as we walk the path of life. So we need to have the baptism covenant renewed. We need to be rewashed, and we symbolically accept the rewashing as we go through the foot washing. From John 13, 12 to 17, we look again at that concept. Um, when he had washed their feet, he'd taken their garments and resumed his place. He said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your teacher, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should, all, uh, you also should do as I have done. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent, is sent, greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. These words are here so that we understand that there is a symbolism and that they and we have to know. We are not providing, proving our humility by performing this task. But we are participating with our brethren in this crucial and critical annual event. The concept is that of Lord and Teacher having washed his disciples' feet, and we also ought to wash one another's feet as an injunction of Christ. We must do it annually on the 14th day of the first month. It is not a holy day, but it must be performed on the night he was betrayed, along with eating the bread and drinking the wine to receive eternal life. John 6, 53 to 56, and Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh has food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often uh, do this as you drink. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself. So eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats the bread without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill. Some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. This night was the 14th day of the first month, and we must discern and participate with the body. We must judge ourselves, as neglecting this may carry penalties. Leavened bread may not be used at this service. Exodus 23, 18. Exodus 34, 25 also shows that although the feast of the days of unleavened bread have not begun, the bread eaten at this service must be unleavened. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. Neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of Passover be left until morning. Unleavened bread was offered every day of the year as part of the sacrificial system. Messiah was the acceptable sacrifice, and we, and now we covenant keepers, are the sacrifice. Um, using leavened bread or grape juice at this service is totally unacceptable, and this is a salvation issue. This proceeds into the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. From the wave sheaf, we commence the count to Pentecost. 
Here we have a period of the sevenfold completion of weeks and a feast and a holy day on the 50th day. The word Pentecost means count to 50. Both wave chief and Pentecost have their services at the third hour, 9 a.m. Pentecost is the harvest of the first fruits. It is spiritually expecting from the remaining human harvest from tabernacles and God's new world order from the last great day. This is carried on in the, in the period of the cycle of seven annual land Sabbaths. The seven-fold completion leads up to the year of the Jubilee. The completion of seven full weeks is complete Sabbath to Pentecost, and the, signif and the cycle of seven years, sevenfold to Jubilee, are, are uh, significant. Uh, the practical application. So I think we'll stop there. Um, that leaves us uh, a little over an hour to cover uh, next Sabbath, so uh, I think it's a, a good place to stop. Um, if you will please stand, we will have our uh, final hymn. Uh, let me do something real quick. I want to... I want to make sure I have... Uh, a record of where we left off here. All right, so if you will open up your hymnals to page 75. On page 75, we'll sing our final hymn, which comes from Psalm 99, titled Holy Mighty Majesty, after which I will uh, close in prayer. So uh, page 75, Holy Mighty Majesty. Okay, if you will remain standing for the closing prayer, bow your heads. Almighty Yehovah, we come before you on this, the first day of the 11th month, assembled here, keeping this new moon as a holy day, as is uh, explained in your word. Father, it is through this review of the law that we hope to gain a more thorough and more correct understanding of your way. Father, we ask that as we study your word, that you would open our eyes to your truth, that you would help us to be mindful, Father, that it is only through your Holy Spirit that we are able to do anything that is pleasing in your sight. And so in the end, it is only through your power 
and through your grace and mercy that we receive the gift of salvation, the gift of salvation that was made possible by the sacrifice of your son for the covering of our sin, the payment of our debt. Father, we know we can never repay the uh, gift that has been given to us, and thankfully it is a gift because we can't earn it. Father, we ask that you would continue to work with us, that your spirit would work within us to do those things that are proper and right in your sight. We ask, Father, that you would help us to be wary of those who would attempt to, to uh, deceive us or, or lead us off of the straight and narrow path. We know, Father, that there are those that uh, purposefully deceive. There are those who deceive not knowing that they are deceived. So, Father, we ask that you would help us to be a shining light in the dark, that you would help us to live our lives as examples for others to see. And, Father, we ask that through your blessings and through your love and mercy that it would become apparent to those that know us and that, that uh, see what happens to us, that you are working in our lives. Father, we ask for your blessing upon your people around this world, many of whom are living in very uh, challenging conditions. And we ask that you would be with them and strengthen them. And Father, we ask that you would be with all of us and help us to, as Paul said, learn to be content no matter what our station in life so that we can continue to focus on doing your will and your work and not get caught up in the cares of this world. Father, it's easy to do, and uh, getting caught up in the cares of this world, we know, will defocus us and, and cause us to put our efforts um, in the wrong areas. So we just ask for understanding, we ask for discernment, and continued grace and mercy as we attempt to walk uprightly in your sight. So Father, we just thank you, we praise you, and we're so thankful for the fact that you have set us aside as a peculiar people. We just praise you again, ask for your dismissal, ask for your blessing on the afternoon meals, and thank you so much, Father. In the name of Yahushua the Messiah, we pray. Amen.